Are we on Facebook as well, John? We are. We're on Facebook. On. All right. Ish. That's fine. Yeah. Ish is perfect. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, my name is Brooke McKinney, and I'm the Con Pat Conroy Center's uh, Communications and Events Coordinator. Um, welcome back to the Conroy's fourth annual Low Country Book Club Convention, presented this year in partnership with BTV Low Country and Nevermore Books, and in funding part by a generous gift from the Pulpwood Queens Book Club. In this first of our two afternoon sessions, New York Times bestselling novelist Wally Cash will discuss his innovative Open Canon Book Club in conversation with a trio of writers selected for the Open Canon. Memoirs, Lori Orbitz, and novelist Silas House and Crystal Nonkin. Winner of the 2019 Pat Conroy Legacy Award of the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance, Wiley is the author of three novels, This Dark Road to Mercy, A Land More Kind Than Home, and most recently, Last, The Last Valley. Wiley has led dozens of writing workshops around the country, including for our Conroy Center. He also served as writer in residence at the University of North Carolina at Asheville. In September 2018, he launched the Open Canon Book Club to highlight the voices and contributions of a diverse group of writers and to foster greater understanding and empathy through their portrayals of the American experience. And we're honored to have him back here in Beaufort with us today. Please welcome Wiley Cash. Thank you. So I think, I think we're live now and I wanna thank the audience, all of you, 15 of you, all 15 of you, for sticking with us and for our authors for sticking with us and for the folks on Facebook Live for sticking with us. We're Zooming, we're, we've got like multiple screens. It's a, it's a big deal down here in Beaufort. And I'm just thrilled that my writer friends get to join me in my study here. Um, this is where I've written all my books. Um, these are all of my paraphernalia from, you know, book tour and my uh, seahorse lamp over my left shoulder here. Um, but it's, it's thrilling to be here. And I want to thank the, the Pat Conroy Center and, and ETV for having us. Um, this is a very innovative way to have a book festival when things are so difficult. Any way that we can come together is, is a great thing to make happen. So I want to thank Jonathan for, for running the tech and extending the invitation and making all the screens go at the right time. So I want to talk a little bit, and I, and I know we're a little bit crunched for time um, given uh, what we have, but I want to talk a little bit at the top about why I created the Open Canon Book Club. So my first novel came out in 2012, and book clubs are such vibrant places for writers, especially new writers, to have their work discovered, to go and share their work with, with audiences and readers that, that read, you know. And so I did a number of book clubs around the country, a few online, a lot over the phone, many, many in person. And I kept hearing um, a, couple of the, a couple of things over and over. The first thing I kept hearing over and over was we drink a lot. Um, I kept hearing we, we've drunk too much. I heard that a lot. And I heard we love to read. And when I would go to these book clubs, they would say, we love to read. We've read all of your books. We've read all of Pat Conroy's books. We read all of Ron Rash's books, Charles Frazier's books. Um, uh, Rick Bragg's books, and I began to see a pattern that a lot of these book clubs read books by people who look like me, uh, by people whose experience of the South or whose experience of the country or whose experience of the world was very similar to mine. And I realized that many readers are drawn to experiences that line up with our own, and I'm certainly guilty of that. I love reading Southern Lit. And a lot of my friends are Southern writers. So when I pick up a book, I may pick up Charles Frazier's Cold Mountain, even though I've read it a hundred times. It feels comfortable, it feels familiar, and it doesn't trouble any preconceived notions necessarily that I have about North Carolina or the South or Appalachia or the United States. It's kind of reaffirming the way I see the world. And I begin to think, you know, I like to have my reading experience troubled. I like to have my ideas challenged. I like to have my understanding of what North Carolina is or the South or America. I like to have it expanded. And I began to think about all the books that I've read that have done that for me, that have that introduced me to a new way of thinking, 
a new way of perceiving, a new way of reading, a new way of being. And I thought, you know, I wonder if when I went to these book clubs, if I had titles ready and I was able to say, well, if you love Ron Rash's books, have you read The Birds of Opulence by Krista Wilkinson? Um, she's an African-American writer from Kentucky. She writes about Appalachia, but she does it in a different way than Ron does. And do you know her book? And from the get-go, my goal was never to bring readers to authors who I thought needed them. You know, the books that I've chosen, many of them have been bestsellers. One won the Pulitzer Prize. I'm not trying to get authors for readers. What I'm trying to do is get author, not, I'm not trying to get readers for authors, I'm trying to get uh, authors for readers. And I'm trying to bring readers into contact with books they may not have come across in their day-to-day -day lives. Books they may not have come across in their library's new release section. Books they may not find um, on, online or, or in their own book club. And I founded the book club in September 2018, as she mentioned in the introduction. My first selection was Crystal Wilkinson's The Birds of Opulence. So I hope maybe some of you have read that book. If you haven't, it's literally one of the most gorgeous books I've ever read. And what I loved about that book was it's a, you know, written by a black woman from Appalachia, from Kentucky, about families, African-American families in Kentucky. And when I read it, I felt my family. I heard my grandmother. I heard my father's voice who had recently passed away. And I'll never forget that I finished Crystal's book on our friend's farm in, in West Virginia in the Northern Panhandle. And I had woken up really early just because I we were on vacation and I wanted to get up early. And the minute I finished that book, I closed it. And this sounds so corny, but the sun was coming up and I sat out on the porch and I waited to hear my wife waking up and I went to her and I hugged her and I wept. And then I waited for my two girls to get up and I hugged them and I wept because that book just put me there. It, it hit me and it spoke to me in ways that if I had only read the back of that book, I never would have expected it to speak to me. Um, and so that experience that I had is the experience that I hope readers and members of the Open Canon Book Club uh, will have. And you can find out more on my website, wileycash.com slash open canon. Uh, and you can join there. You can see previous selections of the Open Canon Book Club. And so, um, you know, when I, when I thought about what to title it, I thought about canon, C-A-N-O-N. Canons are these fixed things. We think of them as these fixed things, the canon of American literature, the canon of Russian literature, the canon of Southern literature. But I wanted to think about ways to open that, to expand that, to, to, to invite new books and new works into our experience, the, the kind of experiences we have over wine or over drinks or over snacks with our friends that are intimate experiences in a living room um, over a discussion. And I wanted to find a way to to broaden that experience as much as possible. And Open Canon, calling a book club Open Canon, felt like a good way to do that. And the book club took off almost immediately. I put it online. At the end of the first day, we had 100 members. And my wife was like, all right, technophobe, what are you going to do? How are you going to speak to all these people? Do you know how to gather email addresses? And I was like, not really. I don't know how to do any of this stuff. And so we kind of stumbled our way through the first couple of months, but eventually we got to just over 2000 members around the world. And so if you join the Open Canon Book Club, every month you get a couple of emails, you get the email newsletter announcing uh, the book that we've selected, you get discussion questions, you get interviews, you get read-alikes. Sometimes the author will share a recipe. I know Silas shared his cornbread recipe when we chose Southernmost in February. And this is the kind of experience that, that you won't get with a lot of other book clubs. And so it's been a deeply personal thing for me. And last year when it got expensive to run the Open Canon Book Club because we had so many members, uh, the, the Pat Conroy Center here in Buford stepped in and, and aided in that. So I'm eternally indebted uh, to Jonathan and to the Conroy Center for helping me fuel the Open Canon Book Club. But today we have three authors that um, that, that, that each took part in a different year of the Open Canon Book Club's uh, existence. 
The first is Lori Horvitz. Um, she lives in Asheville, North Carolina. She was the December 2018 selection of the Open Canon Book Club. And Lori and I teach together at the University of North Carolina Asheville, where she's been a professor, I think, since 1999. And uh, I'm writer in residence at that university. And I chose her essay collection, The Girls of Usually, which we'll talk to Lori in just a little bit about that essay collection. It's fantastic. It is, it's a, it is a fantastic essay collection. The second author we'll hear from is Crystal Hannah Kim. She, her novel, If You Leave Me, was the September 2019 uh, selection of the Open Canon Book Club. And Crystal is joining us from New York City. And then last is Silas House. We chose his uh, most recent novel, Southernmost. It was the February 2020 selection of Open Canon. He's joining us from Lexington, Kentucky. So I wanna thank all of them uh, for joining us today and for patiently sitting through uh, the, the difficulties we had bringing them to join us. But first I wanna introduce Lori Horvitz. Lori Horvitz's short stories, poetry and personal essays have appeared in a variety of literary journals and anthologies, including Chattahoochee Review, The Guardian and Bustle. And she has been awarding writing fellowships from Brush Creek, Fundacion Valparaiso, the Ragdale Foundation, Yotto, Cottages at Headbrook, Hedgebrook, Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and the Blue Mountain Center. She's a professor of English at the University of North Carolina Asheville, where she teaches courses in creative writing, literature, and women, gender, and sexuality studies. So Lori, if you can hear me, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Oh, great, it worked, yes! I was like talking and I was like, are they still there? Or are they like, no, we're not, we're not doing this anymore. Um, so to start off at the top, can you give us just a quick uh, summary, I know it's hard to summarize an essay collection, but just give us a quick summary, maybe a thematic summary uh, of the girls of usually. Um, well, you know, looking back now, because a lot of these essays were written a while back and then kind of compilated, um, a lot of it is about identity, looking at my identity, coming to terms with my identities, gender, sexuality, cultural identity, being Jewish, living in New York, being a New Yorker. Um, so kind of like coming into myself, coming into my own identity and being okay with it. Um, one thing I, I loved about the collection and I, and I wanna, by way of example, I wanna read an excerpt. And I heard you read from this, read a story, an essay from this, like in the early 2000s when I was on campus. and. It was so poignant and so funny. And I've heard you read essays since, one about your dad and, and, and the mug that he got. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But I wanna read a quick excerpt for folks in the audience just to give them a, a taste of, what, of who you are as a writer. You write in the back of, this is you thinking about your childhood. And, and, and let me say uh, to folks in the audience and folks online, Lori had dreams of being a child magician. <laughs> In the back of my underwear drawer, I left notes for myself. By the time you read this, you'll be happier and have bigger breasts. <laughs> but for now, I practice magic routines in front of my pocket poodle, Sunshine, the only family member I could hold and hug. So Lori, everybody, I don't know if you could hear people in the audience go, mm. <laughs> so they laughed at the top and then they went, mm. And that's what I want to talk to you about. You are a really, really funny writer, but you do such a great job of swinging, just like you did in that brief excerpt, of swinging readers from comedy to, to not drama, but like this deep emotion. And can you talk about that on a craft level as if you were like talking to students in a writing class? How do you swing between those two emotions? And as a writer, is it something you consciously do in these essays? Well, I can't say that I consciously do it. I think it's kind of part of my um, genetics, maybe. Um, my dad was like super biting. Um, he was kind of funny, but he never meant to be funny. Um, and, you know, like I remember, like, like when he came to visit Asheville years and years ago and the trolley went by, he goes, there's that goddamn trolley again. Look at those jerks on that trolley. And it's sort of like, it's kind of hilarious, but he, he actually like kind of is serious, but not serious at the same time. But as far as com comedic 
um, parts of my writing. Um, I think making sense of tragedy, I can't remember who it was, one of the great philosophers or said that um, comedy is, you know, making sense of tragedy. It's kind of like this kind of elevated sense of tragedy that you, that's a way to inhabit and swallow it in, in an easier way is so to kind of like write tragic, but in humorously, but also kind of bring it down to like that, what you said, that kind of like, like skating that fine line between comedy and tragedy. And that's, that's where, I mean, I don't plan to go there, but I just kind of go there. Um, it's, I guess it's kind of like a stylistic personality thing too. Cause that's kind of how I view my life. Yeah. So that's how life is, especially now. Sure. Yeah. And, and I, and I, and, and there's another old maxim that says something to the effect of there is no victimless comedy. You know, comedy always has a victim. We're always laughing at somebody else's pain. And in this essay collection, we're often kind of laughing at your pain. Um, your pain of becoming, your pain of understanding, your pain of reflecting on your family. So do you feel like you use comedy kind of as like a, not a shield, but maybe a bomb in your, in your life and in your writing? Um, I guess you could look at that, not as a bomb, but as a, maybe more of a subtle bomb. Cause I think it's kind of like when people aren't expecting it and then it kind of comes and then you're like, ha ha ha. But then you're like, wait a second, what am I laughing at? Yeah, sure. So it's kind of like, it's, it's a way to enter. It's a way to, you know, have people, oh, this is really cool. And then I'm like, whoa. And sure. that's kind of like that wake up call in some ways. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, when did you know, you know, you talked about writing these essays over a number of years. When did you know you had an essay collection as opposed to just essays that had published in many, many places? When did you know you could bring them together in one unified collection? And can you talk about the girls you've usually, both its, its, its source as a title, because it, it's mentioned in the book, um, but also its application as a title? Um, you know, I, I didn't start out thinking I'm gonna write a collection. I just kept writing essays. And, and, and I think that as most writers do, you're, we, we, we become obsessed with certain things. And so I became obsessed unknowingly about identity, gender, location, my culture. I mean, I was sort of like rejecting myself, rejecting my identity, and then kind of coming into it. So I think that after having like 30 essays that had similar themes and uh, of identity and acceptance, um, I'm like, yeah, I need to kind of put this together and, and, and call it a collection. Um, and then kind of coming up with a title um, so Girls of Usually is it actually the title of one of the essays. Um, and uh, it, it is from, from one of the essays and, and it's actually a quote from a, a Mexican woman I dated when I lived in New York. And when I said, hey, um, who's coming to that party? And she's like, you know, the Girls of Usually. So it's sort of, um, it, it's actually her quote, but for me, it was kind of embodied this kind of sense of, quirkiness but at the same time not quite being correct not quite being like there's something kind of queer and odd and like it's sort of like this mistranslation of um identity in some ways so when i kind of came across that i'm like yeah that would be a good title because it's kind of like people that hear it and like that's interesting what is that about you know so and, and, and I think thematically, the girls of usually what you just said about it being kind of a mistranslation, kind of like a strange arrangement of language. I felt that in the collection because each time you meet a new person in the, in the, in the essay collection, beginning in some ways with your parents, there's this kind of attempt to configure this new relationship and understand you know, who is this person? Who is this person in relationship to me, in relation to me? And there's a constant, I don't know, um, understand, like, like gleaning your own identity through your relationship to other people, especially in the, in the essays having to do with college and, and your early adulthood. Do you feel like looking back that you can say that writing this essay 
as an investigative memoir of sorts helped you understand something better about the people in your life? Oh, absolutely. I mean, understand the people in my life, understand myself, understand the world in general. Because when you understand other people, you understand yourself and connection to them, them to you and the world. So absolutely. It's kind of like each person. I, I did a lot of traveling when I was in my 20s. And I feel like meeting a new person is like going to a new country. And you're learning them. You're learning their language. You're learning their culture. And so, and then it's like your connection and your relationship to them becomes different once you know that person. It's like you're in context with them. So, yeah. can you can you read a little bit to us? Read a short excerpt to us. Yeah, um, I I picked out. I, I thought about like what I should read, and I and I picked out this story called A Certain Shade of Blue, because I'm thinking like in this age of the coronavirus. Um, this story is about the, the AIDS, um, the time of AIDS, and um, thinking about how people just were scared. They didn't understand um, it. And anyway, so I'll just leave it at that. And I'll read the beginning parts of it. I don't know. My eighth grade English teacher, Mr. Flannery, told our class, by the time you're 25, someone close to you will die, someone you'd least expect. And then he told us about love, how he met his wife. I'm blame it on fate. I had to meet her. It was part of the big plan. In class, we analyzed lyrics to pop songs. And during our analysis of Joni Mitchell's Chelsea Morning, Mr. Flannery closed his eyes and took a deep breath. And the butterscotch stuck to all my senses. What an amazing metaphor. I knew then the world was full of plans. Love and death and beautiful metaphors awaited me. That year, I set up a dark room and spent hours under amber safe light glow, watching images of my poodles and nature come to life. On occasion, I overexposed the negatives, and when I dumped the photo paper in the developer tray, the impression would pop up straight away and turn black within seconds. Just like that, light could turn to darkness. I fixated on the idea of holding on to an instant, on manipulating moments by burning and dodging and altering light and temperature and time on shooting images dead in their tracks, arresting a moment, seizing it, containing it within an eight by 10 inch border. After printing a photo of my white pocket poodle wearing a light blue jacket, I made another discovery, a certain shade of blue called non-repro blue in the graphic arts world disappears when translated into black and white. Thus, in the photo, my dog's jacket ceased to exist. After my mother died, I wanted to understand death to smell it, taste it, touch it. Through the gay men's health crisis, I volunteered to be a buddy, to help out and befriend a person living with AIDS. And so I met Nestor, an illegal immigrant from Ecuador, an Indian man boy who could have passed for 15, but in fact was two months older than me. We walked around the streets of New York City and I talked in broken Spanish and he complimented me on my accent and corrected my mispronunciations. One day, by the Hudson Street piers, we sat and watched the water sway and listened to the seagulls squawk and stared across the river at the good to the last drop Maxwell House sign in New Jersey. A devout Catholic stricken by guilt, Nestor accepted his fate. Until his diagnosis, he had lived with his aunt in Queens, but her husband didn't want anyone with AIDS near his family. And when Nestor's immune system failed and he had to check into the hospital for a week, his uncle wouldn't let him return. Because he had nowhere to go, his home was now St. Vincent's Hospital. Finally, a Catholic charities boarding house located by the Hudson River in the heart of the West Village offered him a bed. During this time, the late 80s, act up boys and some girls in knee length dungarees and white t-shirts and Doc Martin boots and backward baseball caps held protests and kiss-ins and blocked streets demanding that drug companies and government agencies focus more on helping people with AIDS, on finding a cure, on rebelling against death and invisibility. They organized a protest against the Sharon Stone movie, Basic Instinct, claiming that the film propagated homophobia. Every Monday at the Gem Spa newsstand on St. Mark's Place and 2nd Avenue, I bought a copy of the weekly magazine, Outweek, a publication that reported the latest news in the gay community and outed gay celebrities and politicians. 
At night, activists posted lists of suspected gay people on the telephone poles. I played lead guitar in an all-girl rock band, Rapunzel, led by Diane, president of the local Dykes on Bikes chapter. This was a time of rebellion and love and death in the age of AIDS. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, will you hang back and maybe take a question or two at the end if we have time? Absolutely. All right, thank you so much. Our, our next writer I wanna introduce is Crystal Hana Kim. Um, her debut novel, If You Leave Me, was named a best book of 2018 by the Washington Post, uh, American Library Association's book list, Literary Hub, Cosmopolitan, and other places. It was also long listed for the Center for Fiction Novel Prize. Uh, she was a 2017 PEN America Dow Short Story Prize winner and has received scholarships from the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, Hedgebook, Hedgebrook, and Gentel, among others. She currently teaches at Columbia University and she is a contributing editor at Apogee Journal. Crystal, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you so much for hanging in with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, she has a, a three-month-old little boy at home, so... Yeah. This is my first event since he was born. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, you're doing a huge, uh, us a huge favor joining us today, so thank you, Crystal. Oh, thank you. Um, can you give us a quick summary of If You Leave Me? Yeah, so If You Leave Me is about five characters that are growing up during and after the Korean War, and there are five narrators. Uh, it starts with Hemi Lee, She's a young teenage refugee who has to flee her home with her widowed mother and her younger brother who's sick when the war breaks out. And Hemi is this willful, strong, smart young girl and her dream is to have an education, but she has very few op options because she's living under the duress of poverty and hunger, and then this war breaks out. And then at the Busan refugee camp where she is residing with her family, there are two young men who are vying for her attention. So there's Kyung Wan, who's a childhood friend of hers, and then his older, wealthier cousin, Chisu. So those, those three are narrators, and then her younger brother is a narrator, and eventually her eldest daughter. So I tried to weave these five narrators together over the course of 16 years to show the ways in which the Korean War affects all of their lives. Thank you so much. Um, I've read where you've said before that it was important for you uh, to have characters like yours be seen mm -hmm. by readers. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that idea of being seen especially in, in reference to how your family and your family's culture and also the experience of fleeing the war have not only not been seen, but perhaps hidden in some ways. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, so all four of my grandparents survived the Korean War and I'm particularly close with my maternal grandmother. And when my parents immigrated to America and they, I was born here and when there were immigrants, my grandmother came to take care of me for a little while while, they're, while my parents were working. And so we're very close. And growing up, she would tell me stories of the war and stories of Korea. And I grew up steeped in my Korean language and my Korean food and my Korean customs. But it was strange, I realized in elementary school that there was a strong distinction between what I was learning at home versus what people outside knew. Uh, one example is, I think I was in first or second grade, but this boy in my class, I grew up in New York, he said, what are you? And I said, a girl, because that was the main difference I saw between us. And he said, no, what are you? And I kind of realized, oh, what, what, you know, what he was asking. And I said, I'm Korean. And then I will always remember this. He was so sure of himself. And he said, no, you're either Chinese or Japanese. What are you? And that really stayed with me because at home, I'm learning so much about Korea. You know, this is, that's my identity. And then kind of like in the public sphere, that's, erased 
And so that experience as a child stayed with me. And in high school, you know, in history classes, we learned a lot about the World War II, World War II and then the Vietnam War, but we kind of skip over the Korean War. And so when I started writing seriously, I, I knew that I wanted to write about this forgotten war. And you know how you were, I loved what you were saying about challenging views, Wiley. I wanted to write about the, this war because I felt like there was kind of an absence in our literature. Uh, it's a war that we don't know that much about in America. And I also wanted to challenge the kind of the war narratives that center the male experience. And that's why I started with Hemi, this teenage refugee who is a girl. I wanted to center the woman's experience because just because they're not going off and fighting doesn't mean that they're not affected by this tragedy. So that's that was a kind of the seed of inspiration for my novel. And that leads to the next question I want to ask you. I feel like, you know, that, you know, while the war is part of the novel and obviously part of the, the experience of the novel and the, and the genesis of all these experiences, you focus primarily on the legacy of the war and the effects of the war. And what led to that decision? Yeah, I think that's because growing up, you know, you learn in, you know, going back to what I was saying about history classes, we learn about wars as these dis discrete periods of time. You know, the Korean War was from 1950 to 1953. We learn about these time periods. But speaking to my grandmother, I realized the effects, the trauma, it it lasts so much longer than that. And oftentimes there are intergenerational effects where the trauma then trickles down to how that the mother affects the child. And that is what I was interested in. What do these people, what, what, how are their lives formed or shaped in reaction to the trauma or how are their choices affected? So, you know, Hemi is this girl who wants an education, but because she is growing up during this wartime, she has to make a decision regarding who she marries, right? Or her younger brother who is ill, he, his choices are confined because he doesn't have enough money at first to go to school. So those are the kind of questions that I became interested in. Um, I think that it's just so important to consider what, what happens after, because that's something that we don't often think about. Um. And something that always kind of impressed me about, about this book and about your writing is, you know, this is an epic novel. Like, this is a big, sweeping book. And oftentimes when we think of epic novels, we think of novels that sweep us up in a larger story, which this one certainly does. I mean, it's a, it's a large interge intergenerational story. But you also really drill down on very fine character portraits. And can you talk about how you went about writing a, a, an epic novel, epic in scope, while also nailing down really specific character portraits, maybe on a craft level, how you decided to do that? Yeah. You know, since this was my first novel, I, I feel like I was learning so much about how to write while working on this book. And for me, it always starts with the character. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what kind of personality does Hemi have? You know, she's willful and she's strong, but she also is living under these constrictions where there are all these expectations put on her because she is a woman. Uh, and then in contrast, I wanted to have her younger brother also willful and um, smart, but he has more opportunities because he's a, he's a boy. And I wanted to create these little character portraits. I have Kyung Wan, uh, who is the, you know, the boy next door. He is less politically interested, but he's motivated. You know, I, I wanted to have everyone have a distinct perspective. And then by weaving through their voices together, I figured I could show Korea's, uh, different parts of Korea. Like, what is the experience of a boy who comes from the city versus a, a boy who grew up in the countryside? What is the experience of being a woman at this time? What is the experience of the daughter who didn't, who he, she wasn't alive during the Korean War, but she knows of it. 
and her parents refused to talk about it, you know, what does she understand about her country as it's rebuilding itself? So for me, it's always important to start with strong characters, compelling characters, and then use them to widen the story. Um, so I've heard you speak about your grandmother um, in very endearing ways, and I know uh, your, your close history um, with her. And I'm wondering if, in, in, in researching this book, and, and also writing this book, I know there are, there are personal aspects to this book, were there ever moments of panic where perhaps you discovered something from your own culture that you didn't know? And were there, were there moments of panic where you thought, oh my gosh, I was so close to not ever knowing that story, or I was so close to not ever hearing that you know, oral narrative, and this almost slipped through my fingers had I not written this novel, or, or I was so close to not ever recalling this specific memory. Were there shocking moments like that in the writing and the research? Yeah, I would say that there were just moments where details stuck out to me. You know, I, like I said, my grandmother raised me for a little bit and she told me stories of her past, but I wasn't fully taking them in. You know, I was just thinking like, okay, I had money. My grandma likes to tell stories, but then when I decided to write this novel, I in, I went to Korea, she lives in Korea right now, and I interviewed her and the details were just so devastating. Like she said, when she was, she was a teenager when the war broke out and she and her mother had to walk south for days and they would strip the bark off of trees because the inner layer was softer and more tender and so it was easier to eat and you know i did not grow up ever going hungry and that that kind of i, I think that those types of stories really made me realize oh how different my grandmother's life was you know so i think it's more and not panic but more there were moments of revelation like that where i realized how privileged i was or how important this story is because if I didn't know those details, or if I didn't know how much my grandmother hungered, then I then I thought that perhaps a wider audience would not know those small details about the war too. I would guarantee that you're exactly right. Um, will you read us a, a, a short excerpt? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll read from the beginning of the novel, and this one is from the perspective of Hemi, and. It's 1951, that's all you need to know. and I met where the farm fields ended and our refugee village began. I waited until my little brother was asleep, until I could count seven seconds between his uneasy inhale. I listened as Kyungi's breath struggled through the thick scum in his lungs. If he coughed, I'd stay and take care of him. On those nights, I imagined Kung Wan waiting for me by the lamppost with cigarette butts scattered in a halo around his feet. Everyone in our village whispered what they wanted to believe. The war would end and we would return to our real home soon. Mother and the other aunties chattered in the market. They had survived 35 years of Japanese rule in the Second World War. They had withstood the division of our Korea by foreign men. What was a little fighting amongst our own compared to past misfortune? We can stitch ourselves back together, Mother said. I believed her. When Kungi's breathing was steady and slow, I slipped out through the kitchen entrance and went in search of Kung Wan. He and I were celebrating. We celebrated every night. A year ago, when the 625 war between the North and South began, Everyone in my country fled, propelled by confusion and news in the form of unexpected sounds, bullets, airplanes, the cries of the dying. The mothers, daughters, elders, and children of my hometown stampeded south, hitching ourselves onto trains, scrabbling up mountains, wading through paddies and treading rivers. Mother, Kungi, and I wore white and carried loads on our backs and on our heads. We walked until we reached the southeasternmost tip of our peninsula, 
where shelters gathered around markets and landmarks to form crude villages. All along the coast, people I knew from childhood lived crammed up against strangers. Most settled in the center of Busan, where houses and churches and schools and salvage structures packed the streets. Refugees thronged together as tight as bean sprouts, as if closeness in the East Sea equaled protection. Mother separated us from the other, planting us farther out in the fields, away from the ocean and its currents. She said it was foolish to live so close together. They'll be killed clean in one day if the reds come, swept into the sea like a pile of dead fish. My mother often spoke of luck and what happened in its absence. We were lucky to have been among the first wave of refugees. We were lucky her great uncle had died soon after our arrival so we could claim his straw-roofed home as our own. It was small and time-worn, the less fortunate family sheltered beneath scraps of steel. We were lucky the others, displaced and adrift, had not dared to crowd us out, and lucky to have found this place where life persisted, where news of fighting arrived on leaflets that didn't yet invade our days. I felt lucky for nothing, except my nightly distraction for Chung Wan, whom I had known since childhood and his desire to erase my fears and our secret hours together. I'll stop there. All right, thank you so much, Crystal. And, and if you want to, if you wouldn't mind hanging out uh, at the toward the end for a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Thank you, thank you, Silas. Are you with us? Can you hear me? Do we have Silas? Okay. Lori, can you hear me? We can, perfectly. Yes. This house is the national best-selling author of six novels, including Clay's Quilt, A Parchment of Leaves, and The Cold Tattoo. These three novels were released as a trilogy uh, and reissued by Blair. He is a member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, the recipient of three honorary doctorates, and the winner of numerous prizes. Southernmost was a finalist for the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction and appeared on several best of 2018 lists, including The Advocate, Book List, Pace Magazine, Southern Living, and Garden and Gun. The book was also awarded the Weatherford Award as well as the Judy Gaines Young Book Award. Silas, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Can you give us a quick summary uh, of, of Southernmost? Um, first of all, I just want to say uh, how much I enjoyed hearing Lori and Crystal read, and it's always so good to be with all of you. It's always great to see you, Wiley. Uh, thank you for everything that, that you've done for writers. I appreciate you so much. Yeah. Um, Southernmost is, um, starts on the day marriage equality is passed by the Supreme Court. And the same day, a devastating flood hits the community of Cumberland Valley, Tennessee, and sets into motion uh, several events um, that changes everything for a, a preacher named Asher Sharp. For about 10 years, he's been regretting the way that he reacted when his brother came out to him. And he uh, reacted so badly that his brother disappeared. He hasn't seen him since. And the day the flood, hits and the Supreme Court decision comes down, a gay couple comes to his house seeking shelter. They've just lost their home in the flood and his wife turns them away. And so that's his breaking point where he thinks that he can no longer uh, keep going into the pulpit and preaching things that he really doesn't believe in. And so he decides to stand up in front of his congregation and tell them that he is going to welcome gay people into their church. Um, he sort of, he beseeches them to join him in welcoming people and they promptly fire him. One thing leads to another. He, uh, his marriage falls apart. He loses custody of his child uh, due to a homophobic judge. And so not seeing many other options, he is to kidnap his little boy and they run off to Key West, where he thinks his brother might be. And so most of the novel is them in Key West trying to find 
his brother and also him just trying to come to terms with what he believes in because he started to doubt what he's been taught his whole life. And before we go any, any further, Silas, can you talk about the role of the, of the video that, that's taken of Asher that goes viral and how that contributes to his you know, reputation and, and, and the destruction of his, of his family and community standing? Yeah. This is actually the first novel of mine that I've written that's been set during the digital age. And so I had to, in every scenario, I had to think, how would this really work in, in modern times? And so I thought a preacher standing up and making this really passionate plea to his congregation to be more accepting, to be more empathetic. Um, he's crying when he does it. He breaks down. And so I thought some teenager is going to video this and put it on YouTube and it's going to have very divisive response. On one hand, it's going to have all these people saying that he shouldn't be in the church anymore. And on the other hand, it's going to speak to a whole lot of people who really want to hear this message of acceptance. And so he sort of becomes a folk hero because of this YouTube video, which keeps being viewed millions of times. And he especially is a folk hero for rural gay people. Um, and I just thought that was that made sense for the time period that that it's set in. Yeah, and, and I think it also contributes to his undoing in terms of how his um, emotional stability is perceived in the court yes. system. And I was thinking about um, the documentary Stranger with the Camera and how the camera mm -hmm. can be used as a weapon and the history of the camera as weapon in Appalachia when I was reading your book and the way that video is really Asher's salvation and his undoing, you know. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role of Christianity in the novel, both for Asher and his community? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not asking you to go into your own um, uh, thinking as a believer, but how are you looking to position Christianity when you were writing Southernmost? Well, my main goal was that I wanted to write. Um, I, I wanted to write about people of faith, and not make any of them into caricatures. And I wanted to cover the full spectrum of Christian belief, go all the way from fanatics who who think it's okay to uh, just totally shun people, and that in fact they believe they must shun people, and uh, the whole concept of hating the sin, all the way to people who are Christians and totally accepting. I was raised in a fundamentalist evangelical church, and it was not an accepting place for many people, but especially for LGBTQ people. I'm now Episcopalian, which is a very accepting congregation. And so I just want to look at that full spectrum and try to find the humanity in all those people um, and tell the truth about all of that. What I really love to do as a novelist is think about the absolutes that we often think about as Americans, good and bad, heroes and villains. And I want to write about the gray in between, the complexity. It really troubles me how how much nowadays we boil things down to absolutes. And I think that's what novels are for. Novels are to operate in that territory between the absolutes. So that's what I was trying to do. Um, and I know your, your book that's going to be out next year, I think it's next year, is set in Ireland. And I hope that's okay that I'm saying that. Um, but to my mind, Southernmost, I think it's your first novel that really takes place outside of Appalachia. So can you talk about the process of writing in many, in many ways about a landscape that is beyond your sustained experience? What was it like writing about Key West? Well, I started writing this novel. Um, all I knew was that it was about a kidnapping. And about the time I started it, I was invited to the Key West Literary Seminar. I was down there for two weeks and it kept striking me how the place was the opposite in so many ways of where I was from. And I thought it would be really interesting to have places in conflict in a novel 
as well as people in conflict. And so you have these two places that are really polar opposites in every way and not just, not just values wise, the quality of light going from a river culture to a beach culture or an island culture, the music, the food, just everything about it is so different. And so it made it, a, it I think it makes a really rich reading experience. It certainly made a, a rich writing experience for me to put those two places in contrast and see the beauty in both of them and, and the faults in both of those. And I mean, if you're writing about Key West, it's just a gift for a novelist, you know, I'm, because it is so rich in sense of place. Um, you, your reader is going to feel immersed in the place and feel as if they've traveled there, uh, if you've observed it. Um, and I took full advantage of writing a novel about Key West and went there as often as I could uh, during the time I was writing this book uh, and did plenty of research. So. And can you talk a little bit about, and it just struck me, I didn't plan to ask this, but you know, Asher is from this, this, from Appalachia, from, from East Kentucky, I mean, from East Tennessee and kind of grew up in that culture, but feels totally out of place in that culture once he has this conversion of sorts. And then he goes to Key West and finds a community. And can you talk about that a little bit? It, was there comfort? And, you know, I feel like I'm somebody who's really tied to region. And I know you probably feel that way as well. Did you find comfort in writing about a character that could find community no matter where he was? Yeah, and I think, you know, that's that's the part of me that's in this character, I think. Growing up in a really rural, small town, I was raised, I had a, a wonderful childhood, raised by such wonderful people and felt tremendous love, but I was always an outsider. I, I think that if you are a writer, in most situations, you are an outsider. And so, especially being Appalachian, I have always felt simultaneously like an insider and an outsider because I have this inside knowledge of the culture and I love it so deeply to my bones but I also am an outsider in that culture, not only as a writer, but also as a gay person. Um, and so I, I think for me, that gave me a really uh, great lens to look through as a writer, as a novelist. I think it made me a better writer to be so outside and so inside. If, does that make sense? Absolutely. And, and with that in mind, you know, I, I can't, let you go without talking about how often I feel like you as much as any other regional writer I know, uh, either voluntarily or uh, at the, at the bequest of others, national publications, you're asked to speak for and represent the region a lot. And I know you take that seriously, but I know that is also a burden. And can you talk about the double-edged sword of representing a region? Well, that's exactly it. It's a double-edged sword because when you are asked to represent your culture, you can never please everybody, you know, because ultimately all I can really give is my personal response. Um, I think as an Appalachian, we are so constantly negated by the entire American culture, especially visual media, TV, movies, commercials, etc comedy that it makes it real hard for us to do self-criticism because we feel like everybody's criticizing us but if you are asked to be a representative of the region occasionally you have to do that and so as deeply as I love the region I'm also not going to hold back on bemoaning the way that we vote as a region and I I have gotten so weary um, and, I, and to some degree, I feel as if I've lost my people um, over the last few years to this political rhetoric that has taken over and, and divided us so deeply. Um, so I guess, you know, I guess my answer is I just always try to be as honest as I can. But ultimately, all I can do is, is, is give my own response as an Appalachian person. I, I, you know, that's all you can do. 
Um, will you read us a, a short excerpt if you don't mind? Yeah, this is um, from about halfway through the book. They drove south through the hot black night. Asher had taken the top off the Jeep since it was dark now and the sticky wind twisted inside the cab. Justin couldn't sleep after his long rest at the motel. He turned the music up loud, Tom Petty, over the pummeling wind. Florida raced by them with only the gray highway visible in their headlights. Justin had named the dog they found at the motel, Shady. As soon as he awoke, they had given him a bath in the motel tub and then Shady leapt into the Jeep and curled up on the back seat like Asher and Justin had been his family as long as he could remember. There was a sort of contentment that had settled between the three of them. Perhaps for Justin, it was only resignation. Asher could tell that his son was going through all kinds of feelings about being on the run like this. He wished that he could take all of that from him, but no amount of talking about it would make it any easier. So for hours and hours, there was nothing but the road. The air, humid even before daylight, smelled like salt water and fish and overripe watermelons. Driving, driving. As the light increased, Florida Bay yawned out at the right, dotted with sailboats and small yachts, lined by houses of every bright color. On the left, the Atlantic, too big to comprehend. They passed over dozens of small keys. Justin watched the gulf, pointing to what he thought might be dolphins. Up ahead, there was no railroad bridge, stretching out like a concrete mystery. They stopped to walk out on the old bridge, in the place where gulf waters churned against the Atlantic. Justin dragged his hand along the rusted metal railing. The sun shone in his hair, and Asher imagined how warm it would be to the touch. The water beneath them the Gulf of Mexico was dark and blue, but up ahead, just past the bridge, were the emerald waves of the Atlantic. These were colors that were more than colors. They went beyond that into something magnificent. This was a walk that called for silence, and they both knew this somehow. The dog did too. They listened to the waves striking the pilings and the hustle of the morning wind past their ears. They were walking out into a confluence, and they could feel this power beneath them. In the middle of the bridge, they stopped and looked out at the immensity of the Atlantic. Asher stood behind his son and put his hands on the boy's shoulders. Asher and Justin, father and son, connected forever. Normally, in a moment like this, Asher would say to Justin that he was everything in the world to him. He wanted to tell his son that his own existence had meant nothing until he was born. He wished Justin could know the way he felt about him, the way no child could ever really fathom until they cherished someone else completely. Being a parent was a constant heartache, an endless act of making sure the child was as safe and as happy as a person can be. Asher wanted to tell his son that he would die for him or kill for him and everything in between. He wished he could tell Justin that he had given his whole self to him without question, with total sacrifice. But he didn't need to say any of this. It was contained in the way he touched his son's shoulders, the way they stood there together. Two people alone in this world made of nothing but endless waters. All right, thank you. Thank you, Silas. Um, thank you. If, uh, if there are some folks in the audience who, who may have a, a question or two, um, they can raise their hand or shout it out, not deliver it to our, to our, uh, our writers here before we uh, close out our time. But I have a question for each of you um, to ask quickly on the way out. Is there, is there a book that, or a reading experience you've had that was outside of your race, outside of your gender, outside of your region, outside of your country, that readjusted the way that you saw the world that allowed you to see your world more clearly or more or more exactly. And, and while y'all are thinking about that, I'll tell my own experience. When I was an undergraduate at UNC Asheville, I read uh, the story collection Bloodline by Ernest J. Gaines, uh, a writer who was born on a plantation in Southwest Louisiana in 1933. Um, 
this, the son of sharecroppers, the, the, the descendant of slaves, grew up in a sharecropper's cabin, um, went to a one-room schoolhouse that was also his church until he was uh, out of elementary school and then had to leave Louisiana altogether to continue his, his education in California. And when I read Ernest Gaines' fiction, I read about kids playing out in the woods and in the fields. I read about old people sitting on porches. I read about old people talking about land and landscape and farming. And that was exactly my experience growing up in North Carolina. The way Ernest Gaines' old people talked was the way old people talked in my life. Their, their accents may have bit, been a little bit different. Their race was obviously different. Their region was very different. But it spoke to me in a way that no other fiction I'd ever read in my life has, spoke to me. And this was before I read Lee Smith, before I read Ron Rash, before I read Charles Frazier. You know, those books weren't in the mainstream um, reading experience the way they are now because those writers were kind of getting their, get, getting their feet under them in the, in the 90s to a certain degree. And I met Ernest Gaines before I met them. And so for that reason, he's my literary forefather. He is the writer that I most pattern my own writing, my own style after. And I don't know if any of y'all, maybe beginning with Maury, have had that kind of experience. Um, yeah, I, I discovered the writer Clarice Lispector when I was in graduate school. And I definitely connected with her, even though she she was a Jewish immigrant to Brazil. So she was she's considered like the Virginia Woolf of Brazil. Um, but her writing is definitely on that edge of hilarious and tragic. Um, and quirky and sad. And um, I definitely connected to it, even though she was in a different country at a different time. Um, so yeah, I would say Clarice Lispector, um, her little tiny novella called Hour of the Star is just this beautiful piece of writing, kind of meta narrative. Um, and she's written a bunch of short stories and some essays. So definitely I connected with her as far as inspiration and just, yeah, just like pushing at the boundaries and edges of some writing. Okay, great. Crystal? Yeah, uh, I first read Louise Erdrich in graduate school and I, I started with Love Medicine and she, and that's a story about all these interconnected families on a Native American reservation and Louise Erdrich is a Native American writer, and uh, the way that these it, the way that these characters drive the story is very much about these different people. But through them, and through the way that she weaves those stories together, the novel Love Medicine is about home and the meaning of identity and where you are from and where you belong. And I think that both on a craft level with the, with the different voices, the polysonic voices, and the way that it's so character driven, that really stayed with me and helped in, inspi inspire my writing as well. Because at that point in grad school, I was just writing short stories. I didn't really know what my book would be about. And just the way that she created a tapestry inspired me. Uh, Silas? Well, Love Medicine is one of my favorite books ever. I'm glad you mentioned that, Crystal. Um, the book that changed the way I thought about more than anything is The Color Purple by Alice Walker. It taught me so much about, not only about race, but also it just blew my mind wide open about God, about thinking about God in a different way, um, sex, absolutely race, class, women. I mean, that book just... It, it's the the book that probably changed me the most as a human being is The Color Purple. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. Well, listen, I want to thank all three of you for, for joining us today and, and for, and for uh, staying with us during our technical transition to, uh, to, to trying this, this different thing. So thank you all for, for being in the book club, for giving up your time to me, working with me and get uh, in the book club stuff, and, and for being with us all here today. It's really, really wonderful and kind of you. All right. Thank you. It was an honor to be here with all of you. Thanks so much, Wiley.
thank you, audience, for hanging with us during that. Um, these are all stunning. They're all, th these three books are all very different from one another, but they're all so beautiful and, and, and touching and, and resonant. And I hope you'll give them, give them a read. They're for sale in the back of the room. I wish the authors were here with us. I was joking with the authors. I said, we're all supposed to be hung over together right now in person. That would have been great. I know. <laughs> Not on the screen. <laughs> I mean, that's what's so crazy about doing stuff like this. If they were here, you know, some writers that I'm really good friends with, I see like once or twice a year. And we have these super intense weekend long experiences. And then we go like six months without, without seeing each other. So I wish they would have been with us today, but this is the next best thing. So y'all enjoy the rest of the, of, the, of the convention today. I think we got another, another act coming to the stage here shortly. So thank you all for having me. Thank you. Thank you.